Oh, I forgot I didn't turn the lights off. I'm not ready for that this morning. Good morning, party people. Let me see if I can fix that here. I am totally not ready for a full-blown bright uh, light uh, stream this morning. That is not going to happen on my watch. Uh, so good morning, party people. Welcome to the club on a Sunday morning. <laughs> Jan says Thirdly Dev is almost as popular as you. Yes, he makes the magic happen there. That works uh, pretty well there, so... Uh, yes, uh, good afternoon, party people. You'll see that I uh, got the stream to, or the pretzel music player to now start putting the now playing music on the starting screen and on the pause screen and end screen now too, which is kind of nice. They, although it was a little bit of a shock because they changed the the way that the pretzel player works right before I went live. And I'm like, oh, I'll just launch the music and then, oh, it's a completely different app and I have to go download it. Also, I am wearing a blank. It. Oh, this is like a snuggie. It's thing, this thing is, I don't even remember where I got this thing, uh, but it's like wearing a blanket. It is so incredibly comfortable. It is just not even funny. I almost never wear this on streams because it's so, oh, Bob the Lobster's here. Because it's so unflattering, it makes me look like I am a barrel. Not, I mean, let's be honest, I am not a, uh, a, uh, a person of good looking body to begin with. Uh, but geez, it's so comfy. And so just every now and then I'm just like, screw it. I don't care what it looks like. I'm wearing it anyway. Um, Igor says, it's a really great series, except for a, a rather bad title. It's far from anything. Thanks for all the fish. Oh, well, what, Igor, what do you think it should be called? What do you think it, the title should be? I'd be curious to hear what you think a better one is. You, you never want to give people criticism without giving them the alternative. You'd never want to say, oh, this is terrible, without giving them an idea of how to improve. So, uh, Oleg says, I wonder when you move to Iceland, will you still do those sessions, and you're going to start at 6 a.m. Iceland time? One of the things that's neat about Iceland is the really weird uh, schedule or around sunrise and sunset, I'll show you. So if I look at, for example, I went to the Windows snipping tool, which is totally not where I wanted to go. Uh, if I go say Reykjavik, and I'm gonna mispronounce the Reykjavik uh, weather spark average, here we get uh, average weather in Reykjavik, Iceland. I love Weather Spark. They do a really good job of mapping out the different uh, annual stuff. So this, these two graphs really tell it all. Hours of daylight and twilight, and I'm actually moving further in the north of uh, Iceland, where the, it's even more extremes. We just don't want to talk about exactly where we're living specifically because we've had some really odd incidents of stalker type behavior. Um, so then, uh, so you can see like during the different times of the year, how much daylight you get. And then also, you can also see when the sunrise and sunset is. Uh, so that, that makes for really interesting clocks, you know, in terms of when I'm going to be awake and when I'm going to be asleep. If, if you really let me pick, I kind of like the, the, the cycle. I know there, I think it's called diurnal or biurnal. I'm not sure what the name is, uh, but where you basically sleep twice a day, that really meets more of what my schedule is. Like I'd love to sleep two, four hour uh, time spans and that would work beautifully. So uh, in terms of when I'm gonna teach, I have no idea. We'll totally see how that goes. It could be all over the place. Let's come back. <laughs> Uh, so, and Havidigalur says from Iceland, this is why you might want to have something like a Philips Daylight Bedroom Light. Yeah, the other, I don't know if you follow uh, on Twitter, Swift on Security. Swift on Security used to pretend like being, uh, she was Taylor Swift uh, talking about security. But one of the things that Swift on Security has talked about recently is daylight LEDs that you just put in your ceiling instead of regular overhead lights. Um, and they're surprisingly inexpensive. They're not that bad these days, especially given how long they last. So uh, I'm probably going to go for that, uh, especially because I, yes, the uh, Vitigler says the summer full daylight drives some people crazy. I'm one of those people who I can sleep 24 hours. Like I can sleep at any time and not any place. I mean, they're like, I have a hard time sleeping in planes, strangely. Uh, I can sleep in a car. I can sleep in a car like that, but in a plane, it's tougher for me. I don't know why. Uh, but I, daylight doesn't bother me at all. Like, I can sleep through that. Um, DFW says, are you taking any pets to Iceland? No, we had a dog, Ernie, for about 
10 years. And after Ernie, like I, the only reason we were able to get Ernie was I told my wife, look, I have to have a dog. We're going to get a dog or that's going to be the end of the relationship. And she, she finally went, okay, we'll, we'll have a dog. And we went through the journey together, picking out the perfect dog. So Ernie was with us for like a nice long decade. It was just absolutely wonderful. But I agreed with my wife that uh, whenever we stopped, uh, whenever Ernie passed away, that we would no longer get another dog. And I'm totally okay with that. I, because, too, I think having a dog in Iceland is a little tougher, you know, having to deal with all the snow and that kind of thing. Um, Vitigalur says, uh, uh, daylight does affect melatonin production, so curtains are a good idea. Yeah, I definitely want to do, like, blackout curtains, uh, too, as well. All right. Well, we've got a few uh, questions already popping up in the queue. Let's go uh, take a look at what we got over there. Over on YouTube, Bandar says, good morning, Brent. What would be a good alternative to a self-join in a 300 million row table? I want the job to go parallel. You can totally get self-joins in a 300 million row table to go parallel. There's nothing necessarily wrong with a self-join on a 300 million row table. It sounds like you want to get into more details about what the execution plan looks like and what the indexes look like on a table. But just by itself, a self-join isn't that big of a problem. I do those kinds of things all the time. In the Stack Overflow database that we use, both questions and answers are both stored in the post table, and I do self-joins to that uh, all the time. Next up, uh, SymbioticoDB uh, says, Hi, Brent. Using file tables to track file changes for... Wah, no! No! Uh, SQL Server is not a good place to store files. If you want to store files, there's this uh, kind of server that's, that's been out for a really long time. It's, it's called a file server. Put your files on a file server and your data in a database server. You don't want to spend $2,000 a core US for standard edition just to act as a file server. SQL Server sucks for that kind of thing. Um, plus, remember, everything that you put into there, you're replicating to other places with stuff like availability groups, database mirroring, your transaction log, your, your full backups, all that stuff is just going to churn like crazy. Put the files in a file server. Uh, next up, Kurt says, can someone explain the contents and value of turning on in clients includes client statistics? I have no value to that at all because for me, whenever I'm doing performance tuning, the SSMS is a terrible client. It uh, takes a really long time to digest all kinds of data. Uh, the bigger your result set is, the worse it is. So for me, I've never found value in that. I, I, I don't understand quite why people do. I'm sure that somebody does have a good value. I just haven't been able to see it. All right, next up, let's see, Al Getty. Al Getty, uh, good to see you. Says, hello, big SQL master. See what I mean about the thing making me look really big? Like I'm wearing a big giant, that's why he called me a big SQL master. He's saying that I'm fat. He's also correct. Uh, I would like to know your point about point of view about triggers. Do they really affect performance? All a trigger is, is a query that runs when events happen. So for example, when you do an insert, update, or delete, hi Dharma, welcome to the club. When you do an insert, update, or delete, you're triggering code to happen. The more triggers, or the more that you trigger to happen, the worse performance will get. But really, that's no different than putting the code into a stored procedure or a function or anything else. The more code that you run, slower it's going to go. So triggers get really vilified. A lot of people hate triggers. I don't mind triggers. If you performance tune them, they can be a great alternative to pr other problems. Um, so sometimes people have said, hey, I need you to enforce uh, that a certain column has a certain value in it, and we don't have the time to change all kinds of things in an application. I'll use a trigger for that. You just have to be aware that the more code that it is, the slower that it can go. And you have to tune it just like you would a regular query. Uh, Adam says, isn't a trigger like any code? If you don't need it, then it's bad. And if you do need it, then you just have to make it run fast. I think that's a really good way of saying it. Nicely put, uh, Adam. Next up, Santa says, ho, ho, ho. 
Any thoughts on why the duration for a one and a half terabyte backup would suddenly go from two hours to six hours? There have been no changes recently. So it comes down to two things. How fast can you read the data? And how fast can you write the data? And I'll show you a blog post I've got on it. So if I go Brent Ozar faster backups, I've got a blog post on how to make SQL Server backups go faster. If you read through that, I give you tips on how you can measure how fast you're reading the data, how fast you're writing the data, and then improving the performance of those two things. But that's all it really comes down to. Either suddenly you're starting to read the data slower or you're starting to write the data slower, one of the two. Next up, let's see here. Get out of that uh, zoom there and put the next one up. Sergey Sergey says, "Why nobody implements incremental differential backups to do that? Uh, why? So they they do um, di uh, differential. Oh, incremental differential backups. So you're talking, but then you'd have to restore every one of those differentials." To be honest, what a differential is really for is faster restores. Um, so faster restores, if you want the fastest restores possible, you generally want to restore as few pages as practical. So that, that's really where differentials come in handy, is that you restore the full and only the last diff, and then the log sense. So. Next up, Oleg says, you mentioned that you prefer int versus a good for primary key. Other than a good takes more storage, are there any other gotchas or things to be aware of when using the good for primary keys? Yes, and I'll show you where to learn more. <laughs> to learn more, if you go to brentozar.com and then you log into your account and you click training, my videos and downloads, then over there under your instant replays, you have these mastering classes. You're going to go to mastering index tuning. And then under mastering index tuning, you're going to watch the module on the death method for heaps and clustered indexes. And in there, I teach you how to design a good clustered index, how to design a bad clustered index. My son, he principles that teach you the differences between those two. What's that you said? You don't have a membership to my site yet? Well, good news, everyone. You have a Black Friday sale still on, and you have one day left in order to score the classes. So if you want to go grab that, you can go get. That one's in my mastering classes, so you'll either need to buy the level two, or else you can also go get the mastering classes recordings. He says, I do, actually. There you go. Perfect. So go to mastering index tuning and watch the module on the death method for he heaps and clustered indexes. <laughs> Next up, uh, D. Tovey, good to see you again, says, thanks for your help. You're welcome. Um, I use some of your techniques. I was able to reduce our uh, restore time in dev. Oh, great. Uh, glad uh, glad you saw it. Uh, Santa says, you're behind on your training video progress. You're right. And I, I just implemented that on a pay the homepage of the training site, like, two, three weeks ago, because I know that a lot of people buy those classes and then they don't actually watch the videos. So I kind of wanted to stick it right in their face. Yo, you've paid for all these modules and you haven't you know, gone through and actually watched them yet. Uh, so it's kind of fun to see that pop up inside there. GeoServe says, many years ago, a friend of mine told us that self-joins were too bad to avoid for performance reasons. Um, was it a problem that had been solved later or was it false even then? So it's so funny. I'm always amazed how many people uh, say, I read somewhere, and then they come to me and go, was this correct? Why the hell don't you go to the author? Go to whoever says that. If somebody says something's faster, make them prove it. That's also why almost all my classes are mostly demos these days. Like I show you hands-on so that you can go and see it uh, so I can prove to you that one thing is faster than the other. But that's just junk. That's just garbage. I don't know where somebody got that. Next up, uh, Bess says over on YouTube, is the database tuning advisor within SSMS a good way to explore for performance tuning? Not really. So the database engine tuning advisor, that doesn't really take into account that you could tune the code. All it takes into account is that you could tune the indexes. 
Also, the index tuning suggestions aren't very good. Now, there's a white paper on there uh, that where Microsoft has talked about that, had talked about the internals of how the index tuning advisor, the database tuning wizard kind of thing works. Um, and it's better than nothing, but you could easily do better if you invest five, 10 minutes of your own time digging into queries. Now, I will say it gives you a lot of bad advice very quickly. So if your job is to gather a whole lot of recommendations and you don't really care whether they're good or not, then there we go. Adam says, should we trust it over Clippy? They're, they're, it's like saying, you know, which one should we trust, dumb or dumber? You know, it's, I don't know that I would really go for either of them cooking my chicken. Lee says, does Brent ever rest or chill? I tend to go to bed around 8 o'clock. So I tend to go to bed around 8 p.m. and then I wake up around 2 a.m. So I get like six hours of sleep overnight and then I tend to take a one to two hour nap every afternoon. Usually I conk out in between somewhere around 1 and 2 p.m. and I'll conk out for an hour or two. And I almost feel like I'm cheating at life because the second half of my day after the 2 p.m. nap is entirely goofing off. Like I'm not, I'm not uh, doing any work whatsoever. I'll stick in my, my head in the, like the company chat room from now and then. Or sometimes like Richie will want my advice on something and I'll go uh, hop in there on that. But otherwise, I'm really just productive from like 3 a.m. to uh, noon. That's about it. I say that's about it, but I mean, it's just you, you, the, when you work for yourself and you kind of choose these hours, then you can start to adapt and figure out when you want to work and when you don't want to work. I don't want to work. I want to bang on the drum all day. I sing that a lot. Uh, over on YouTube, uh, SK says, I'm not a DBA, but I look after a few SQL servers. Uh, one had an issue where SQL Server pegs a single core for a few minutes, which causes app issues. Any tips for working out what it's doing during this time? Yeah, I have a video on that, actually. I'll show you. So if you search for Brent Ozar SP who is active, so Brent, S, uh, uh, Brent Ozar SP who is active, what you want is this right here, how to use SP who is active to find slow SQL Server queries. SP who is active is a totally open source script uh, written by a brilliant fella out of the uh, northeastern US, Adam Mechanic, who uh, wrote a very high performance, very quick query to go find out what queries are running right now on your SQL Server. That's the first place that I would go start. Odds are you're going to find it right from there right away. And I have a whole video on how to use it right there. So if you search for Brent Ozar SP who is active, it's totally safe. Uh, I run it all the time in production in very big, ugly servers. Big, ugly servers. <laughs> Next up, Erica from Iceland says, oh, why didn't it pop up over there? Uh, says, do you turn off IntelliSense and SSMS when working on a busy system? So it depends on the size of the client's databases and objects. I tend to not make changes to stuff like that because I usually only have a really limited time in front of clients. Um, I usually only have a you know 48 hours to turn a SQL Server around, and when you're in front of a client, you only have like 48 hours. Every single thing I do, the client will question. So I, I want to make as few changes as possible. And if I make a change somewhere, I want them to go, wow. So I tend, if they're used to having it on, I tend to not make any changes to it. Um, I, I, it's not wonderfully useful. It's better than nothing. But I think if I had a full-time job, again, working at one particular shop, I would probably go with Redgate SQL Prompt, but I would just configure the heck out of it. Because by default, it does all kinds of weird auto-suggestions. And I'm like, ah, I don't really want that right there. At that, I love the code formatter, though. Code, for, code formatter and joining is really cool. Control K, Control C, good to see you again, says, uh, thanks for your brilliant job on supporting SQL Server. You're welcome. I appreciate it. Very cool. Um, says, what is your suggestion on controlling the number of VLFs and not allowing VLFs to increase on an OLTP system? In my experience, people micromanage the heck out of TempDB. It's like they're standing over it and they're like watching it like a surgeon over an operating table and they're expecting that they're going to slide little dials around all the time and keep changing it. I'm like, look, here's all you do. Go take whatever the total size of data is on the system, 
25% of that, that's probably how big your TempDB should be. Break it out into either four or eight data files. I don't get really picky about which one. And then grow them all out to that size and walk away. Just leave it the way it is. If you find that your TempDB is growing, then you want to go find out what's the max size that it ends up growing to. Just leave it alone while it's growing. If people tend to do a whole lot of activity that blows out TempDB, after it grows out, then go, okay, now we're going to reset expectations again. We're going to shrink all the files back down to zero, grow them all back out to our optimal size, and walk away from it again. That's really all you should have to do there. Oh, Greg says my sound effects aren't working. Let me go uh, tweak that. Uh, the driver that I use for that has been a little wonky lately. So okay. there we go. Next up, Sharad over on YouTube says, is there a case where doing heavy reporting on a secondary, assuming means an availability group, affects the performance on a primary? Yes, absolutely. Totally, absolutely. Happens all the time. Uh, so lots of ways that I can illustrate that. There, it can cause blocking, believe it or not. Uh, if someone needs to make a schema change on the primary, that'll uh, something that's doing reads on the secondary can actually block it. Uh, if it's a synchronous secondary, the more work that the sync secondary is doing, the slower the inserts, updates, and deletes will be replicated across, which will slow down uh, transactions on the primary. So what I'll generally tell people is if you want to use an AG replica for reporting purposes, it should always be async. Like never report against a synchronous replica because you're just going to slow down inserts, updates, and deletes. Next up, uh, Binu over on YouTube says, I've seen an index bringing down my database, which is three terabytes in size. I'm using a custom script, which is using online equals on. Could you please help? For specific problems with specific scripts, that's kind of beyond what I can help without seeing the script. So if you want to show the script, go to dba.stackexchange.com, dba.stackexchange.com, uh, and that's, that's where you'll be able to post the script. I'm not laughing at your question. I'm laughing at Richie. I'm at the Pizza Hut. I'm at the Taco Bell. I'm at the combination Pizza Hut and Taco Bell. Uh, Richie and I spend way too much time on, probably, I might argue, not enough time on TikTok. Maybe it's just the right amount of time on TikTok. But that, that's, God, I love that song. I've been thinking more lately about how I would, um, how I would start doing TikToks uh, again, because I did them when I was over in Iceland, but I did them just with touristy stuff. I was thinking, how could I go about doing humor TikToks uh, with the SQL Server? And that's a great example of a sound I could use. Just, just the time that it takes to do a good quality one is so high, and it's I just love watching other people's. Jan says, here on Twitch, Jan says, I'm working with a few developers that often use union all. Is it better to rewrite the query so there's less unions or leave it as is? They're not combining results from different databases or tables. Union all can actually be fast. Uh, there are tricks with, uh, like say that you want to filter on two different columns. There are times when doing a union or a union all is actually way faster than putting an or clause in the query. So don't you, I would say you're probably have the wrong prejudice there that can be a great performance practice and I even teach it in my mastering uh, query tuning classes so what I'd say is step back and say what's the problem with the execution plan that you think you need to solve because it's probably not the union all uh, let's see here control K control C says I didn't get your point with TempDB in regard to my question on VLFs um, so the th oh you so uh, I thought you were talking about TempDB's log files. I thought you were micromanaging around there with that. So with, with user database log files, it's the same thing. I'm going to say whatever the size of the database is, set your log file to be 20-25% the size of that and walk away. You're done there. You don't have to do anything with VLFs unless it grows. If you find it growing beyond that, again, with the micromanagement, I find people thinking, oh, I'm going to shrink it back down, and there's this battle all the time of trying to resize it. You need 20 to 25% of the size of the database at minimum. And if you're doing, you say, a classic example of mine, I had a client with one terabyte databases, but 800 gigs of that was just one table. So if they did a re index rebuild on there, they needed 800 gigs worth of space in the log file. So you figure out whatever size it's going to, join, to grow to, and then once it's there, shrink it down, grow it back out to that size, and you're done. That's the end of it. But don't micromanage it there. 
Next up, SQL Pilot says, expanding on the trigger topic, isn't a new index basically maintained with a trigger? Um, you touched on the vilification of triggers, but people have no problem adding new indexes to huge tables and causing overhead. So I, I hear where, you're, where your head's at. I, I don't think that that's really the case, though. I, I understand where you're coming from, but adding a new index is so lightweight compared to the work that people often do in triggers. People are like, begin trigger. All right, now let's go hit web service. Now let's shell out to DOS. You know, they, they chain in all kinds of things inside of there. So that's, that's where I get nervous. Uh, Sashin says, I'm planning on starting blogging, and one of the reasons to do so is have another source of passive income. You don't get paid for blogging. That's, let's uh, get that out of the way right here and now. Blogging doesn't make you money. Blogging builds you a readership, and then you can sell things to your readers. But if all you're going to do in to make money is blog, you're not going to make any money for that. Um, you, what you might do instead is you could write for places that uh, pay per article. So MSSQLTips.com is one example of those. I forget what they're paying these days. If it's like 200 bucks an article or 250 bucks an article, um, SQL Server Performance also does it. Um, there are a couple of places that do it. I don't know that I would expect that to last a really long term, though, and the competition's kind of fierce. Uh, so I, I wouldn't, I, if you want to make passive income, go Google for like how to make passive income, and there are all kinds of ways to go do it. Um, if you're trying to do it as a database administrator, for me, of course, my best uh, route for that was training classes, building training classes. But blogging and training classes aren't necessarily the same thing. Just because you blog doesn't mean you have training classes. Just because you have training classes doesn't mean you have to blog. Next up, Firemander says, if you went for to a football game and Calm Store indexing was your team, would you buy nosebleeder seats, good seats, or a front row ticket at the 50-yard line? I would want to be uh, right up at the 50-yard line, like I would be uh, right as close as possible, because I find them to be really interesting. So Calm Store indexes came out in SQL Server 2012, and when they did, they had so many limitations. They made the table read-only. They didn't support strings. They, there's so many uh, gotchas with that. And you can kind of see, as you, as you watch Calm Store's uh, evolution through time, everything that they've loosened up on has worsened performance. So if your tables are kind of like a data warehouse fact table circa 2012, you get amazing performance, but the more compromises that you make along the way, the worse your performance gets. I love seeing and explaining to people the, the different compromises that they're about to make and showing how performance uh, gets steadily worse. So I just find that incredibly uh, interesting. Uh, next up, Eriker says, uh, question number two, what is your method of judging the impact of parallelism on a query? Does it get faster? So if a, a query, just to keep the number simple, so if a query takes four minutes when it's using one core, if I can get it to take one minute by spreading the work across four cores, then parallelism did me a good thing. So that's kind of the big place that I start with is just query duration. When I know I have a lot of churning to do, can I cut runtime to do that churning? Steve says, what other interests do you have outside of computing and IT? Oh, in, in the computing IT field outside of data, um, I read Hacker News pretty frequently. So, and I don't know, it's always risky opening up Hacker News. <laughs> So if I go to news.ycombinator.com, news.ycombinator.com, I find this kind of interesting. There, It has a lot of things that geeks are interested in. So for example, number two, water cooling a Canon camera to unlimited, enable unlimited 8K recording. That's amazing. I am intrigued in that. That's kind of cool. Um, uh, yeah, see that I'm not quite as interested in. Uh, moths draped in a stealth acoustic uh, evade bat sonar. So this has all kinds of other, has really interesting stuff. News.ycombinator.com. That probably is the, the, a good example of the kind of thing that I'm interested in. I don't 
think it shows my likes publicly, like which things that I upvote. Oh, wow. Scented candles, an unexpected victim of the COVID-19 pandemic. How amazing is that? You know, that's just intriguing. So there's all kinds of uh, stuff. Also, this this one hit uh, this morning. Growl is in retirement. There probably aren't a lot of you out there who use Macs like I do, but Growl, I've been using a Mac for a really long time, and Growl used to be the notification system. Uh, immediately seeing that brought back all kinds of interesting old memories. <laughs> Uh, our, so, so along those ways, so the kinds of things that I find interesting over at Hacker News are things like Amazon Lambda, uh, serverless development. I don't do serverless development. I don't do any development. Uh, I suck at development. Uh, but I find it very interesting, like the things that developers have to do in order to make serverless work. I'm just uh, enthralled. I think serverless is totally the way of the future. It's just absolutely amazing. Uh, over on YouTube, RJ says, my friend has a VM that has two cores. Um, SQL Server's minimum licensing is four cores. So unless you're licensing the host with Enterprise Edition, it doesn't make sense to make a VM that tiny. It just doesn't really do you any good. Um, so I would say in terms of if this is a production server, I would probably go up to, say, four cores. And then at that point, the question becomes more interesting. Um, currently, max degree of parallelism is set to zero. Look, par who cares? When parallelism, two cores, you have a watch. You're running SQL Server on a watch. Um, what should cost threshold be set to? Read my SQL Server setup checklist, and I give you examples of what to set cost threshold to. Uh, let's see here. Next up, uh, Bandar says, we have an application that stores columns that can fit in an Enver 50, 50 in an Enver Care 4000. Dev said that changing data type is not an option. How else can I reduce memory grants? Well, you can't. On we go. Next up, Cape Masi Masi Mas says, is there a calendar for the next classes? Uh, yes, go to brentozar.com and click training up at the top. So if you go to brentozar.com and then up at the top, there's under training, there's watch Brent streaming live. Now you can also click on training and it'll show for each of the uh, for each of the classes. If you click on each class, it'll show you their next dates. Uh, but also if you hit watch Brent streaming live, then that way you can go get into there and it'll show you if I'm streaming live, there I am. Oh my God, it's me. It's infinite me. Oh my, and I'm picking my own ear. Oh, that's kind of interesting. Um, but if you go down further, it has the upcoming live classes. So there it has the list of classes that are coming up next. Next up, uh, Al Getty says, I really appreciate your time and opportunity. You're welcome. Um, how many rows is the largest table you've seen in your career? You know, I don't think that I've ever tracked it, but I've seen stuff just off the top of my head. I know I've worked on 10, 20 billion rows. Um, I'm sure other people have worked on way larger ones. Uh, because I tend to be an emergency turnaround type thing, um, People will, <laughs> uh, because I tend to be an emergency turnaround type thing, um, I don't tend to work with things for a very long period of time. Um, and the, usually by the time you hit 10, 20 billion rows, you have a whole team of experts uh, working on a system and you probably don't need me as much. But 10, 20 billion rows would be uh, about normal. Uh, let's see here. I got to move that out of the way so that I don't hit that over in the background. Next up. Um, Symbiotic DB says, um, I've seen implementations of a sharded architecture. Is that architecture common to find in your experience? Yes, absolutely. You can Google for database sharding, and there are tons of resources out there uh, talking about how it works. It's very common for software as a service type companies. Next up, Binu says, how can I customize Ola Hollinger's script to create only for index maintenance jobs? I saw that it creates backup and check DB2. Rather than customizing the script, what you want to do is just install it and then drop the things that you don't need. So SQL Server has the drop command where you can go drop things. Just go drop the stuff that you don't want, like user tables, sales, or the history of everything that you've ever done that's bad in that human resources database. Definitely a good thing to drop. Uh, 
Sachin says, for any issue that I troubleshoot and I explain to my manager, at the end he'll say this used to work for years and why it started giving a problem now. How should I tackle that question? Oh, this happens all the time. So someone will come to me and say, you know, this worked great for 20 years. And I'll say, oh, how big was it in the beginning? Oh, it used to be much smaller. Have you, have you tracked the size over time? Because you know the clothes I used to wear when I was small? They don't fit me so good anymore. The things I used to be able to do when I was tiny, I can't really do anymore. Data changes over time, just like your waistline. Now, you've got to be careful with who you use that line with, but, you know, yeah, it's, that's the first place that I go start. And, I go, and, I go, <laughs> oh, but it's, and I'm like, well, I'll tell you what, tomorrow you come to work, in the pants that you wore 20 years ago. And then you'll stand up in front of everyone and you'll tell me how this code used to work just fine 20 years ago too. We'll talk about your fashion choices and how your waistline has grown over time. I'm kind of a butthole though. <laughs> Adam says, once the future is serverless, the machines will put us in pods and use us as computing power. I've got bad news. You've seen the kind of computing power present inside these questions. Those computers are going to be in trouble. <laughs> um, Sharad says, have, are you ever bored at work? What motivates you? I'm going to sound so crass. Money. I don't work just because I like what I do. I want to retire. There are people that I love that I would love to spend more time with. And of course, I'm talking about Richie. Uh, no, I'm I, there. Like all of you in here, like this. Uh, this to me isn't really work. And like I'm not getting paid for this. I do this, you know, kind of for fun. And I would probably do it uh, forever, even after I retire. Um, but for me, it's the the number one thing that motivates me by far is money. How can I make sure that I take care of my loved ones and get to a point where I can retire? I want to be able to retire me personally, and then the further that I get down there, I also want to be take care take care of my loved ones, and that's it. But that is by far and away. I'm not really interested in making the world a better place. I'm not that guy. I'm not Barack Obama. You know, I didn't come in with a vision where I really could see 20 years uh, down the road. <laughs> Richie. Um, but yeah, it's, oh, mom says easy. There we go. There's mom. Mom says, I love you, son. Very wise. Um, so yeah, exactly. So uh, next up, Erica says, Union All introduces a blocking sort operator. Union doesn't. The former can do, do, do. How would you assess which one to use? I think you might be overthinking it a little bit. I would kind of step back and go, what is the data need from the query? Union All uh, takes all of the rows. Union does a dedupe. So it really comes down to, do you need things from both sets of queries or do you only need one? If you're worried about the blocking operator, then try to think about maybe dumping the data into temp table instead and then doing multiple passes into the temp table. Then you don't have to worry about the blocking sort. But there's a great question. It's the kind of thing that I go into in the mastering query tuning class, but it's pretty far beyond what I could cover here. Uh, next up, Binu says, does old Holmgren script rebuild column store indexes? Yes, but it makes performance worse. Under absolutely, positively no circumstances do you want to run the command alter index rebuild on a column store index, and I teach you why in my fundamentals of column store class. I explain why that kills uh, column store performance so badly and the techniques that you need to use instead. And it's not reorganized uh, either. Uh, next up, Dabo says, can you give me an idea about this error? At least one of the following parameters must be specified. Body, query, file attachments, and subject. Well, uh, what that means is that you, you didn't supply one of the parameters. That's all. Next up, uh, let's see here. Uh, Bleard, Bleard says, uh, how bad was your argument with, for management for proper backup sizing, including recovery? Oh, anytime you can't get the results that you want for something like backups, copy the stakeholders. 
the people who have the data, who own the data that's inside that database. Um, so for example, and this is your last resort. This is going nuclear. This is when you can get into really bad trouble. I, I just added that. Um, you can get into really bad trouble. But if I had an adversarial uh, relationship with management, I would say, okay, look, here's the deal. I, we need seven days worth of backup history because I'm only running CheckDB every seven days because we have a server the size of a you know hamster. Um, and if management said no, I'd say, okay, look, I need to cover my bases just so that the users can understand that we're going to lose data. I'm going to copy them on an email just so that they're prepared. Here's what I'm going to put in that email. Dear sirs and madams, your databases will lose data under these specific circumstances. To mitigate that, it would cost this much. If you would like to mitigate that, get your budget approval and go to this manager. It is not something technical that I can solve. It's not a switch that I can turn. I need this much resources to protect from that problem. And I would tell that to the manager. This is what I'm about to send. Are you cool with that? And then when management says yes or no, either way, I'm going to go send it. I'm like, look, it's not your problem, manager. I know that we don't have the money, and it's, it's not you would do it if you had the money, but you don't. Uh, so then that way, I, it takes everybody out of being the bad guy, and it just makes it clear to the users if they want the money to do it, then they've got to go pony up for that. Next up, uh, Jan says, you always say that five index is on optimal. No, 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 no. You're not listening when I say that. That is a starting point. My guideline of five and five, and I'm very uh, uh, clear that it's a guideline, not a rule. It is a starting point. You often need more or less depending on your workload, your query performance requirements, and your hardware. So it's not a rule. It's just a starting point. To learn more about that, go watch my Fundamentals of Query Tuning class. Ari, you did. You just did, right? You just asked a question. Some people, I swear to God. Uh, DJ Khaled! DJ Khaled is here with another one. He says, good to see you. I'm replacing SQL replication with my own replication, as you didn't encourage the use of SQL replication. So I did that too in my career. So there was a point where I worked for a wine and spirits company with about 5,000 laptops spread all over the, the US with uh, SQL Server data. And we didn't want... Um, we didn't want to deal with SQL Server's replication because it sucks when you have 5,000 uh, servers involved. So built our own replication from scratch. It's not easy. It, it sucks. It's hard work. But it, it, it's definitely a lot better alternative than, uh, than that. Next up, uh, DJ Khaled says, to track rows and change in tables for replication, do you check some all? Do you do a trigger that we didn't say da 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 So I like just having a, a last updated date. I add a last updated date to every table, and then I maintain that with a trigger on insert and update. I just maintain that by uh, updating that column. It's super low overhead, very fast. Uh, so I would highly recommend that. Then that way, whenever the application wants to go find out what's everything that's changed since a certain date, then they can go pull, show me all the rows where last updated date is greater than the date time when I needed to get stuff done. Uh, so that, that's the place where I would start. Uh, next up, Counterin says, what is your opinion on recursive CTEs? They're cool. I don't have anything against them. They're cool. Thankfully, I don't have to write them very often. I, I usually get called in for emergency performance tuning. For me, it's less about writing new code from scratch. And I also really admire and respect people who can just bang out recursive CTEs off the top of their head. I always have to go back to one of my previous ones to get an example because they kind of flummox me. I know I have to have the starting query and a union all and a query back to the CTE, but it always makes me a, li a little uh, tricky. Well, for me, create a date. I, I just use the last up data date and whenever it gets created I set that as to get date or get UTC date whichever it is so it makes it easier oh, the almighty beard says how can I view all of the queries executed in the contents of a context of a transaction who is active only shows the current running queries but not all the previous ones you can't SQL server doesn't track all of the queries that have been involved in a transaction the, the, the thing I always tell people is 
in the SQL Server engine that works for you also has to work for, say, Stack Overflow. So if you could imagine if you have 30, 40,000 queries running per second, you simply couldn't afford to track all of the queries that were involved in a transaction for every single session. So what I would say is if you, if you need to do that, there are two things you can do. If you know ahead of time, you use extended events, like Eric Darling's SP human events will capture every query that runs inside of a session. Or if you need to do it after the fact, buy a transaction log reader. Uh, so there's log reading software like Quest Lightspeed, Apex SQL log reader, uh, that will go back and read the transaction log. Then you can pluck out when someone logged in and everything that they did during a session. It ain't quick. It's a giant pain in the rear, especially on production size transaction logs, uh, but it's doable. Next up, uh, VJ Red says, during performance troubleshooting, one of the challenges I face often, is this a SQL Server victim or a root cause? Tips to differentiate? Yes, that's actually my entire mastering server tuning class. So the way that my classes work is you start out with index tuning and query tuning on like one query at a time, then I gradually amp up workloads. And then in the last class in the series, mastering server tuning, I give you a running workload and we work together to figure out what the root cause is. So that's my mastering server tuning class. Chock full of tips inside that one. Uh, next up, Yogeshwari says, hi, tell me something about PL SQL. How is it different from SQL? Oh, I'll show you. So I have a, a blog post about that. I'm going to say Brent Ozar Postgres uh, differences. Because I wrote up a blog post that talks about differences between SQL Server and Postgres. So if you search for my name and then two important differences between SQL Server and Postgres, that will get you a starting point. And I'll copy paste this, stick this into chat the, so that then that's out inside there. Um, so great. I'll just go ahead and scroll down through them since it's got a couple in there. In Postgres, CTEs are optimization fences. I want to say that that's changing in 14. It's either changing in 13 or 14 for not all queries, but some queries. With SQL Server, SQL Server will reorder this stuff and make it happen wherever, whereas with Postgres, the CTE has to execute first. And then the next thing is, is that you can't just jump into an if statement in Postgres. In SQL Server, I can simply start typing, hey, if something exists, go do it. But with Postgres, you have to start out by declaring some code blocks inside here gives you just a quick example. This is also a great example why people will say, oh, I'm just going to migrate my application from one database to another. And I'm like, oh, no, the hell you are. There are so many differences out there. <laughs> Next up, Cleo says, how do we prevent SQL injection? Whenever someone passes in a string, Never, ever, 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 ever use that to build a query. Instead, keep it as a parameter. Never, ever, ever use it to build the body of the string. Uh, next up over on YouTube, uh, Adi says, how often do we need to back up SQL Server certificates? I'm paranoid as hell. I am so paranoid, I'll back them up every month just because I want to have something on disk nearby that I can use for decrypting. If I only back it up once every six months or a year, odds are that backup has moved off somewhere else and I don't have easy, quick access to it, and tracking down the original sucks. So I, I'm all about doing that every single month. Uh, now, Ahmed, no, this stream's about Microsoft SQL Server, so we're just going to focus on Microsoft SQL Server inside here. Alex asks, any way to replicate jobs in an always-on environment? Yes. Uh, so th I'm going to give you two answers on that one. Yes, you can do it, and I'm about to show you a web page where you can learn how to do it. But two, I don't know anybody who actually does because what they usually end up doing is having different code in jobs between production and DR. For example, the place where you write your backups to is often different between production and DR. But if you want to sync them, if you want to sync them, search for Cahias Agent Job Sync. 
if you search for Cahias Agent Job Sync, uh, Jonathan Cahias of SQL Skills has written apps and scripts that will go through and sync them for you. I there it's old. I mean it's it's uh, pretty old stuff, but as far as I know, I think it still works. Uh, so there you go, Cahias and always on uh, or Agent Job Sync. Next up, let's see here, Babesh says, uh, differences between SQL Server and MySQL. SQL Server has a lot more capabilities around high availability, disaster recovery, parallelism features for large queries, uh, enterprise features like auditing who saw what and who did what, uh, fine-grained single server authentication or sing, uh, single source of truth uh, authentication so that people can authenticate in with their active directory or domain or, or uh, Unix logins. Um, so it's much more focused at enterprise-y customers, whereas MySQL is more focused around uh, building small web apps. And, I, and it can scale to big web apps, just like, you know, SQL Server can scale, MySQL can scale. They're just different target audiences. Uh, so, uh, Bamu, you, obviously you weren't just paying attention, so you uh, kind of missed the thing that I just said about Cahias, but you can go back and watch the replay. Syed so says, uh, Sir, I want to learn SQL in uh, one day. Oh, me too. Oh, I would love that. That'd be really cool. When you find out how to do that, let me know. Oh, you were asking me. Oh, I don't know, son. I've been working on it for 20 years. I still feel like, man, windowing functions and the merge statement, they kick my butt every time. You're probably better off if you want to learn something in one day, probably best to like make an omelet, maybe. You could probably pull that off inside one day. Uh, so I'd go for that. Next up, Dan says, we have tables in Azure SQL that regularly get truncated and inserted with new data. Ugh, ugh. Sometimes views that build upon these tables return no rows, even though tables have data. Why could this be? Oh, generally, okay, so there, there are a few things that can cause this. One thing that can cause it is if the selects use no lock. No lock, it's dirty reads. It won't necessarily see accurate results. You could be querying a secondary when the transaction hasn't finished yet. The primary could be, or the, the job that's doing the repopulation could wrap the whole thing inside a transaction, and the transaction may not be committed. I could go on and on in terms of that one. What I would probably say is, rather than doing truncating and inserting, that's a design pattern called Groundhog Day, where you reload every table from scratch every time. That's not sustainable long term. You would want to move towards something that's more incremental logging or incremental loading. Could, could I troubleshoot that as part of my consulting work? Absolutely. But just the number of causes are so large that I'd be like, hey, let's take a quick step back. And why are we doing Groundhog Day? Uh, Prashant says, help me out in... Pa and I can never say pagination without singing it like Rod Stewart. Pagination, whoo! Uh, so help me out in pagination. Sure, I'll show you. So if you search for SQL Server Offset Fetch Pagination, uh, pagination, whoo! Uh, so here, Aaron Bertrand has a post on how you can do offset and fetch for pagination. SQL Shack usually has some pretty good t tutorials too. So those will be the terms right there that you want is offset, uh, offset fetch. Um, there are performance gotchas. You have to index appropriately for it. If you don't index appropriately for it, uh, then you can end up with some performance problems. Uh, next up, let's see here. Pagination, woo! Uh, next up, I could do that all day. Uh, Addy says, second question for the day, what's your recommendation for a two terabyte database that takes a long time to back up? Snapshots, oh yes. Sand snapshots by far. This is the technology that makes the most sense when you cross over the one terabyte line. Snapshots before you use them, and I don't mean database snapshots, those things aren't that, aren't that good. Sand snapshots are baller and let you snapshot a multi-terabyte database in a matter of seconds. SQL Server doesn't, uh, doesn't use that, so welcome to the club, but you're in the wrong, uh, wrong room. The, the room you want is, is over there. Maybe it's over there. Go click over there. Oh, but definitely snapshots, far and away the big deal. 
Goodness. Next up, control C, control K, control C, DBA says. Uh, I remember at the time you said rebuilding fragmented indexes doesn't make sense. Fragmentation is a big deal. I'm curious to how, how query optimizer tackles fragmentation, which it would see on optimizer stats. Does the optimizer ignore fragmentation level because the index pages are in memory? No, the optimizer will actually make different decisions depending on paginate. Or see, I'm so obsessed with pagination. Woo! That even though I'm reading fragmentation, it, fragmentation doesn't work quite as well for that. Fragmentation. Woo! That's not quite as cool. Um, but so it does actually make different decisions. It's just so rare to see out in the wild. Most of the time when I'm seeing performance problems out in the wild, it's because people have the wrong indexes. It's not that SQL Server goes, well, this index is too fragmented. I'm going to choose a slightly different approach. So it's possible. It's just so insanely rare. Next up, Symbiotic ODB says, I felt tempted oh my, to educate uh, Microsoft support engineers with your amazing blog posts and videos because at times they don't seem well trained. Am I a bad guy to pointing them out? So here's a trick that you do uh, whenever you want good results from Microsoft, don't call them stupid. Right? It's the same thing you would do with your coworkers. If you If they're in a position of power and they have something you need, don't call them dumb. In Microsoft support terms, you, you use the word escalate. So you say, great, I've tried that, let's escalate this. I need to escalate this to the next tier. And then they need to respond to you and explain why either they don't want to escalate it to the next tier, but they, they don't want to deal with a problem customer either. Just say escalate, and then they'll, they'll usually shuffle it up a level and you'll get to smarter people. I have so much respect for uh, Microsoft support because they have to deal with some truly you know, really crazy people. Um, and you're right in that they're not all well educated, but you know what? They make way less than you do, the people on first tier. Uh, so they make way, way less uh, than, than you on the first tier. Bob says, I know some Microsoft engineers who use Brent scripts. We used to require an email address. Uh, we used to not give the stuff out on GitHub. Uh, and I was so amazed by, uh, though it's terrible. It's, I've tried that, it's, it's awful. Uh, I was so amazed by the number of Microsoft people, like PSS engineers, uh, who were downloading my scripts. And I was like, yeah, I made it. Uh, that was really cool. Next up, Darman says, any recommendations for tracking SQL Server settings desired configuration drift? I want to say dbatools.io. Go to dbatools.io, and I want to say that they that's where they have pester testing for your SQL servers. So pester testing is a way that you can do unit testing for SQL Server to make sure that the configuration matches the one that you want. I don't use it because I don't do uh, like fleet administration. I don't manage hundreds of SQL servers to trying to get them to all be the exact same spec. But that's the place I would start is dbatools.io and look for their pester testing type stuff. Uh, next up, uh, my friend asks, CW Train says, I've seen corruption in a few rows. Uh, corruption's on a clustered index. Why is it not repairing the page from the secondary? So one possibility it could be is that you have logical corruption. SQL Server has logical corruption bugs where it will knowingly write bad data to disk. So in a case like that, uh, it, the data is going to be garbage on both sides. Another example is, let's say that the corruption existed before you set up the secondary. Like if this, the data has been corrupt for a year and you only set up the AG secondary six months ago, meaning you seeded it from a backup that actually contained the corruption. Those are the common examples. Next up, CW Train says, how do you establish objectives consulting with new clients? I had recently had a con uh, conversation with a little, went a little like, you, uh, we agreed on a 10% speed improvement, you made 9.3%, so we don't want to pay you. Oh, that's a great question. I'll show you on my site. So if you go to Brent, oops, we'll go to brentozar.com, and up at the top, there's consulting. So if you click on consulting, hi, Harold, welcome to the club. 
If you have consult, or you click on consulting, and it, it, it explains what my first engagement is. This is the only way that I start new clients, is I only start them with a two-day SQL critical care, where we walk through the SQL server, and I get an assessment of what kind of shape they're in. Then, if someone actually wants me to fix specific things, like, okay, Grant, you identified that this stored procedure is our biggest problem. You gave us a proof of concept rewrite. We actually want you to pay to build the finished product. We'd like you to get it through testing and uh, write up documentation on what you did. Then I'll do exactly what you described. I'll say, I, based on logical reads with these parameters, I expect to get an a you know 200% performance improvement or whatever the number ends up being. And if I don't get that, you don't pay me, and that's it. And so then that way, if I don't meet it, I go, you know what? Nope, that's fine. I couldn't achieve the level that I expected, and so you shouldn't have to pay for that. I'm not going to say, like, if I got you 90% of the way, you should pay me 90%. Nope, if I couldn't do what I agreed that I would do, you don't pay a dollar, and that's how that works. Um, now, that's aggressive, I know, but that's also why when I do those kinds of things, I say, here's the stored procedure, here's the percent improvement that I expect, and it's either going to be on duration, CPU, logical reads, like we're going to pick specific parameters and specific metrics. And then that way too, I know when I've crossed the finish line. And if I couldn't cross it, then I don't get to eat my dessert. Next up, Erica says, Sundays are pizza days. Uh, can you share a query selecting your most favorite and excluding your least favorite toppings? Um, true story, uh, Friday was our pizza day because of Thanksgiving, so we didn't feel like cooking anymore, so we went and got uh, um, uh, pizza. Uh, so for me, the I tend to go with... So, you know, when you're married, happy wife, happy life, you know, I want to go to whatever she likes that I can tolerate. Uh, so we end up with pepperoni, uh, onions, mushrooms, spinach, which is actually surprisingly good, and easy cheese, meaning light cheese, and that sucks. But okay, whatever, I'll do it. Uh, but so happy wife, happy life, and so I'm happy with those. If it was mine, if my wife passed away and I was getting a pizza, I would do a Chicago-style uh, deep dish pizza, which is not thick crust. That's ridiculous. The pizza places have uh, out in the uh, side of the U.S. have gotten to this thing where they think deep dish uh, pizza is a big thick crust. That's not what it is. It's a pie. It's really thick ingredients with lots of cheese and everything. I like pepperoni, sausage, like everything that's going to kill me. I want that in the pizza. I'm all about it. Um, least favorite, I used to say was uh, um, <sighs> sardines. I didn't really like sardines, and then I've kind of grown to like those over the years. So uh, even I know Andy, Andy Mallon gets upset about this, but I don't mind pineapple. We went to Hawaii, and I had pineapple on a pizza, and I was like, this actually isn't bad. It's not too bad at all. Uh, next up, Scott says, what are your thoughts about running uh, integrity checks on a log shipping secondary to avoid the overhead? So the problem is the only thing that that checks is your log backups, not the data pages. If corruption's happening on the data pages, the data pages aren't replicating from one place to another. So I am not a fan of that to test your backups. It is okay to take a snapshot on a log ship secondary and do check DB on there to make sure that you can fail over. But just because you fail over, your backups can still be trash, which means that if someone says, go back to a certain date and restore the data, you may not be able to. So that, unfortunately, is why the answer there is sad trombone. Uh, next up, SQL Pilot says, when you set SP Blitz Cache's minutes back parameter, that only filters on last execution time. Is there a way to get the number of executions and associated stats during the last X minutes? Nope. SQL Server doesn't track that built in unless you turn on query store. Uh, SQL Server doesn't have anything in the plan cache that samples over a period of time. What instead you do is, if you go to my mastering server tuning class, I explain how to harvest SP Blitz cache to a table on a regular basis. Like every 15 minutes, you run it with minutes back equals 15. And then that helps you get a better idea of what's happening inside a, any given 15 minute time span. Jan says, do you know if there's a way to give a user without admin uh, privileges the privileges to edit SQL agent jobs created by others? 
I don't, I don't know much about security. I don't, I just don't do security work. I tend to focus on performance tuning work. That's a great question to ask on dba.stackexchange. I remember hearing people being very frustrated around SQL agent permissions. I just don't know what the granular specifics are. All right, so we're going to stop here for a five-minute bio break so that I can go uh, refuel my espresso. Five-minute bio break. While we take that five-minute bio break, a quick shout-out to this week's sponsor, my Black Friday sales. So you can go over to brentozar.com slash Black Friday, and you can see the deals that we've got going over there on our training classes, SQL Constant Care, the Consultant Toolkit, all kinds of stuff. Those sales end tomorrow. Tomorrow's the last day that you can go by. So you can hop over there at brentozar.com slash Black Friday in order to learn more. So five minute bio break and then we'll come back and keep plugging along on your questions. See y'all in five minutes. <laughs>
I had to laugh at, uh, uh, who was it, this uh, CW train? CW's at train that I'm sensing some bias in the selections of sponsors around here. Yeah, when when uh, when I first design out this this the marketing calendar for the year, I block off most of November for the Black Friday sales. But normally companies buy sponsorship, and so you see different companies sponsored in on here. It just wasn't available to them for uh, for uh, November because I want to promote my own stuff because I like making money. Um, <laughs> next up. I laugh at, I think it's early to probably put this in himself. He says, look at that skyscraper over there. Do you think someone is using SQL Server? That's, that's one of my favorite uh, lines. We talked about that in the last uh, session out here, the last live stream that we did. Um, let's see here. Next up, Leela says, how can we, Leelu Multipass says, how can we retrieve information database and display it in a scene builder? Um, so I don't know what you mean by scene builder, unless you're talking like, like, um, something for video stuff i don't actually know there i'm that's more of a front-end application type thing something that you would do in c sharp java etc i don't do any development whatsoever all i specialize in is the uh database itself i got out of the barrel yeah i did and that uh so now i'm in an avid adam savage uh industries t-shirt um so Mick says, how is max dop different from cost threshold in terms of performance for queries? I'll show you where to go look for that. So if you go to Brent, oops, let's come in over here. If you go to brentozar.com slash go slash CX packet, brentozar.com slash go slash CX packet, that's going to take you to a post about the CX packet wait time. And in there, I explain the differences between cost threshold for parallelism, max stop, and then how you set those two things. So that's over at brentozar.com slash go slash CX packet. And then I'll paste that in into the chat just so that we got that over there. Next up. Uh, Sudhir says, uh, any tips on how to make a name in the SQL Server community for introvert and shy people so that I can be headhunted for jobs instead of being in a stack of resumes? Sudhir, that's a great question. I'll tell you a secret. I don't like people. I do not like people at all. We have a good, friendly time inside here. Sure. But you know what I do is I kind of think of it as like a costume that I put on. Like when I go and, uh, thank you, thank you. I got that yesterday. Um, it's not as espresso. It's espresso. I, I think of it as a costume that I put on. So like, okay, now I'm going to go stream or now I'm going to go to a conference and present. And I, I even have different shirts that I wear when I do that stuff. And I think of it as I'm going to pull on this this thing and I'm going to pretend to be somebody else. I'm going to pretend to be somebody who's outgoing. Over the years, that became easier for me. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's really tough. Like my hentai clippy suit. Um, and the, the racing uh, suit. So I just put, it's funny, I just gave my racing suit to Goodwill. Um, and that's true too. It's nasty and nice. I, so it, what helps for me is thinking I'm going to put this on and I'm going to do something. So it's the same when I go to write blog posts. I am almost like an exaggerated version of myself. I think it's easier to write blog posts as an introvert than it is to stand up and talk. Like to, talking at conferences, that's still challenging. Um, but uh, so if you want if you want to do blogging, just think of it as you're an exaggerated version of yourself, whatever you would normally be at home. And also remember, when you start blogging, ain't nobody going to read you. Like the first year, nobody's going to read you, and that's okay, because you're really getting your training wheels on. Uh, Stephen King had a uh, thing, uh, CW Train says, I literally put on a shirt, that's, it's, or put on the suit. Um, the, uh, Stephen King had a saying that like when you're gonna become a writer and you sit down at the beginning of your day and you start writing, like the first two, three pages are gonna be junk and it doesn't matter. Just start writing, assuming that you're going to throw the first two or three pages away. At the end of the day, that's when you make the decision about what pages, how far into that you're gonna throw the work away. And what often you end up finding is, well, you go, oh, that isn't that bad. I'll just go ahead and keep it in. Or no, this is terrible, and I'm just going to throw this part out. 
the great part about your first year of blogging, it's going to be garbage. Who cares? Doesn't matter. You're going to think it's good one year in, it's still going to be garbage. Doesn't matter. It's still just, just keep churning the stuff out. Because plus two, think about the number of blog posts that you've read from other people that are garbage. Myself included. People give me stuff all the time in the blog comments. This is terrible. You should be ashamed of yourself. I'm like, I don't care because I make more money than you do. Um, hi, uh, Tegus, Tegus, Tegusigalpa shows up. Uh, Tegusigalpa now. Uh, Sidesh asks, what are the top five tuning concepts that we need to consider? Five is probably beyond what I can do quickly in terms of comments, but I'm going to give you number one. Know your top weight type. Know what your SQL Server is waiting on. If you're working on anything other than the top weight type, you are wasting your time. There are exceptions to that, like when your server is having poison weights like resource semaphore weights. Uh, but the rest of the time, whatever your top weight type is, focus your time there. The rest of the time, you are shuffling deck chairs on the Titanic and nobody cares. Uh, Erica says uh, over on YouTube, have you at, looked into the quirks and bugs with the merge statement I have? Yeah, that's uh, totally terrible. Yes. Um, so yes, and there, it's still awful, tragically awful. Uh, next up, uh, the Almighty Beard asked, do you have any plans for upcoming virtual conferences where you'll be giving more of your classes as a pre-con? So here's the thing as a presenter. When you speak at someone else's virtual event, you are relying on them to build a quality platform. You're relying on them for video, audio delivery, chat, and all of that. When you don't have those things, when you're a starting presenter and you don't have a YouTube channel figured out yet, or you haven't figured out how to work OBS or any of that software, then it makes sense to go to a virtual conference. But for me, I don't trust other people's delivery mechanisms. Now, there are exceptions. SQL bits, I'll do all day, every day. SQL bits is fantastic. Um, and even if they're struggling with a, trying to figure out a web conference platform, I still would have gone. They're fun. Their delivery platform is fine. Uh, but if, even if they didn't know what they were doing, I would still go speak at SQL bits because it's an amazing uh, conference and I want to make sure that they succeed. But the rest of them, I'm kind of like, I would rather stream directly to y'all whenever I want and then take the money myself. Well, I give it to somebody else. So that's kind of my, it's kind of like what, what if you were going to be on a database administrator somewhere, would you want to be a contractor or just get paid directly? Sometimes there are advantages to being a contractor, like when you don't have a network and you need the contracting company to go get you the job. But if you do have people coming to you, I don't know the contracting is a really good fit. I, there's going to be some weird shakeups in the virtual event space over the next uh, few years. It's going to be kind of tricky. The free ones, sure, I can understand why people go to the free ones. But again, you're here. So uh, Almighty Beard says, I understand. I'm just a sad EU citizen. We are working on that for next year. I don't have a timeline yet, but we are working on that again. Uh, uh, control K, Control C, yes, but I would just Google for that. I, I don't, it's like I learned it 10, 15 years ago. I used to know Matt Mullenweg. He used to be in the same user group that I was, so I just learned from sitting next to him. So, uh, Next up, Abuse Sysadmin says, I was once told by a level one support person that I had to spend like six hours with them before they could escalate. Is that true? No, not at all. Um, and the, the magic words, if your production is down, is say, we have a production down emergency. This number of employees and uh, customers is affected. We have a critical situation. That Microsoft's escalation is based on is production down? How many people are affected? And is this a critical situation for you? They call it like a crit sit for short. Uh, so they will escalate instantly if you say production is down, 10,000 users are affected, I have a critical situation, we need to escalate this immediately. And whoop, 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 up it goes. Wish I didn't have to know that. Um, Anuraj says, a developer said a query is working slow. What will be the first thing to check and resolve? So I teach you how to do that in my free class, Watch Brent Tune Queries. 
So if you search for Watch Brent Tune Queries, I have a totally free series of videos that I've done from conferences over the years. You can go Google for Watch Brent Tune Queries, and then there are several like one hour long videos where I teach you how to do exactly that. So that's Watch Brent Tune Queries. Next up, let's see here. Um, so we're going to focus on Microsoft SQL Server inside here. So that's notice the, the title of the video that you're on. We're just talking about SQL Server here today. Next up, Venkatarama says, not exists or left join, which is faster. Oh, it's so funny. I have a blog post on that. So if you search for that plus Brent Ozar, you'll get a blog post where I compare those two. And I show you how to compare inside your own queries. It is not that one is consistently faster than the other. They can both be faster in different situations. So in that blog post, I tell you how to figure out which one is faster for your queries. So search for Bren Ozar and then that. <laughs> Drop table employee says that the best table uh, best pizza topping is another pizza recursion. Yeah, or you could almost say that's how the calzone came about, I suppose. It's like two pizzas that are just flipped on top of each other. And did you see Papa John's pizza sandwiches? How they like take a pizza and they fold it in two? At first I was kind of horrified, but I was like that's kind of America right there. That's kind of exactly what we do. Uh, SQL Pilot says, my friend can't said he can't documentation on what check ID means in the second output of SP Blitz Cache. Oh, no problem. Your friend hasn't read the documentation, but we'll show your friend where the documentation is. <laughs> so if you go to firstrespondercit.org, firstrespondercit.org is the GitHub repo, and then there's this folder, and I know it looks scary. It's got a lot of sy uh, syllables in it. But if you click on it, they have things in here like the check IDs. So you can click on there like SP Blitz Cache checks by priority. And then you can see here's a list of all of the things. Now, I should say it's probably not all of the things. It's probably many of the things. But like your own documentation, it's probably riddled with bugs. So if you want to find out which ones are which and maybe even help correct errors while you're in there, Let's be honest, you're not going to write documentation or your friend isn't going to write documentation when he won't even read it. Welcome, Norn. Welcome to the club. But there you go. <laughs> Next up, uh, Control K, Control C says, what would you do at age 80? Is that related to SQL Server? When do you want to take your hands off SQL Server? OK, this is going to get philosophical and my mom's going to get pissed. Erica and I have a philosophy that when we can no longer enjoy life, we're going to get together in the Porsche and drive off a cliff. Specifically, the cliff and Telluride at the end of the airport. Telluride Airport in Colorado has this big, huge cliff at the end of it. We're going to get into the car, max a throttle, race off to the end of the runway, and jump off the cliff. And then we're going to die together. So there you go. Uh, if one of, a, one of us was irreparably uh, damaged, you know, like if one of us had some kind of life-threatening injury and got in a car accident, we wouldn't have, see, there's my mom laughing. Um, uh, if, if one of us was, was hurt, like let's say that I had cancer and I passed away, she wouldn't die or I wouldn't, like we, it's not like we have a death pact where we both have to go at the same time. But if, when we're both at the point where we no longer enjoy life, we are going to Thelma and Louise the bejesus out of it. <laughs> Drop table says Brent's mom watching every stream is the cutest thing ever. I think, I don't, I'm surprised my dad doesn't watch actually come to think of it because I know he's on, he was on Facebook. I think he was going to delete his account there for a while. I'm not quite sure what the status on that one is but all right uh next up georgie says <laughs> totally shifting gears literally uh when a view is queried can we rely on the sql engine to always apply join elimination if appropriate yes as long as they're like left outer joins and you're not filtering on the tables that are doing the left outer joins <laughs> that, that could be as well um so as long as they're like left outer joints, you should be pretty well off. I can imagine situations with terrible like nested views that do group buys on top of each other 
on the left outer join uh, columns, that that might be the case, but the rest of the time you're totally fine. Where I, uh, inner joins, it can't eliminate them, because inner join says that I uh, have to go check the existence of rows in the other table. You can help that with foreign keys, but that's uh, kind of tricky though. Theo says, uh, in an always on avail or always on uh, cluster, so this is tricky. You could this could be a failover cluster or it could be an availability groups cluster. With TemTB on local NVMe, will SQL Server failover if the NVMe drive fails? So what you would always want to do is you always want to use those drives in pairs and you want to use mirroring. So you would want to use the OS levels uh, drive mirroring. NVMe drives are not expensive. They're really cheap. So it's real easy to mirror those things. That way, if you use your own hardware monitoring stuff, like whatever you get from Dell, HP, Lenovo, Cisco, whoever, um, they'll tell you when one of the drives fails, and then that way you can schedule an outage where you would fail over at a more appropriate time. So that's what I would say there. Um, if you're using a, uh, a VM in the cloud, so like Amazon EC2 with NVMe storage, you should expect that servers will fail all the time. Do I know if a TempDB failure will trigger that? I don't think so by default, but SQL Server has database level uh, health detection queries that you can add in if that's important to you. Uh, let's see here. Scott says, what documentation should we maintain on each SQL Server in case of disaster? So for me, it comes down to what would you need to recover the database or recover the server back to the point where the business is comfortable in the time that's allowed by the business. So some companies have a very long recovery time objective for DR, like a day or three days or seven days. And if you have one to three to seven days, you can make a lot of mistakes. You can take a lot of time. If your failover is minutes or hours, you can't take a lot of time. And so that's when often people will set up a warm standby and they'll replicate across using tools like always on availability groups, SAN replication, log shipping, etc. What I normally find is that as people want shorter and shorter recovery times, documentation isn't enough. And let's be honest, Scott, no one reads the documentation. People won't even write the documentation. They sure as hell don't read it. You've seen inside here, half the questions that we get in here, people could answer via Google. It amazes me that y'all even show up to hear me be a human Google. It's so amazing how that works. I'll take it. It's fun because I can make fun of people, but... Abuse sysadmin says it would be much better if his mom was correcting his SQL Server advice. <laughs> well, note it, it is kind of funny how rare that y'all actually correct it, which is kind of funny. I'm, I am very serious about like drawing the border of what I know and what I don't know. Um, Alex says, Brent, yesterday you told us about two magic buttons in SQL Server. Are there any magic buttons in SSRS or Power BI? I don't uh, do, like do any kind of performance tuning on either of those tools, so I couldn't tell you. But I'll tell you who I would check with. Over on YouTube, search for Guy in a Cube. Guy in a Cube is a stream run by Adam, Le uh, I almost said Adam LeBlanc, how weird is that? Adam Saxton and Patrick LeBlanc, and they have all kinds of tips and tricks on SSRS and Power BI, and they have awesome uh, streaming quality. They're fun to watch. Uh, truly great people. I really enjoy watching them. So that's Guy in a Cube on YouTube. Uh, next up, uh, oh, uh, Igor says over on YouTube, uh, what do you think about Phil Factor and Joe Selko? Any similar authors to recommend? You picked two pedantic people who are very detail oriented write very, very long posts, and they wear formal clothing. 
No, I don't have any other similar authors to recommend. It's kind of amazing that we ever got two of them, and they happen to be friends, so that kind of tells you something. But I don't know any similar authors to recommend, and I'm going to say something kind of radical. I don't read either of them. I did a long time ago, but I'm like, for the love of God, get to the point. Get, I don't have all the time in the world. Stop telling me stories about British farms and just get to the point. Uh, so if you like those kinds of books, I would say probably, I don't have a good recommendation for that. Uh, yeah, you got me there. Boy, they're gonna, Phil's going to see this and he's going to be so pissed off. Joe's not. Joe's retired, so Joe and I talk all the time. The guy's a genius. Both of them are geniuses. I just can't stand their writing anymore. Uh, Steven says, uh, how, if my server cost threshold for parallelism is five and I want to change it to something sensible, how do I ch prove that that change impact improve performance or not? Well, attend my mastering server tuning class. If you have a live class season pass, go to the mastering server tuning modules and read the ones on parallelism. You don't have to watch the rest of the class first. You can jump straight to the parallelism modules and start from there. There are two modules, one on normal parallelism and one on on abnormal parallelism. So you can combine those two, watch them in order, and then that'll get you to the uh, thoughts of that one. Uh, let's see here. Delete a couple of things there. Uh, Greg says, what is your preference for espresso? Nespresso, because it's really super easy. And I know I was only going to do Microsoft SQL Server questions, but that one had a one-word answer, Nespresso. Otherwise, baristas. Bandar says, uh, what are the most memory expensive operators like sort? Um, sort is a great one. Hash match is another one. So between sort and hash match, those are usually the two that burn the most RAM. On SQL Server 2016 and newer, adaptive joins is there, but it's uh, uh, much less of a consumer than sort and hash match. Um, IBM hasn't made servers for years. Lenovo bought their service business or server business years ago. Uh, Roman says, what kind of liquor could I offer you in case life would give that chance? I tend to not drink brown liquors these days because they just don't usually agree with me, um, especially in the quantities that I, that I like to drink booze. Uh, so if it's like just one shot, I can do bourbon or whiskey, but um, generally tequila. Uh, I'm a really big fan of tequila, especially sipping tequilas, like nice quality tequilas, stuff that costs like 50 bucks a bottle. Doesn't have to be that expensive, but like 50 bucks a bottle. At 50 bucks a bottle, you can actually sip tequila and it doesn't kill you. Oh, abuse sysadmin, that's a great point. Marco Russo does have a lot of good Power BI content. I was just watching one of his videos uh, recently, so very good. Uh, next up, Sasha says, how can I baseline multiple SQL servers by putting minimal load on them? It sounds like you're trying to generate your own fake load, and that's worthless because every workload has different performance characteristics. Some are CPU intensive, some are memory intensive, some are storage intensive, some are locking intensive. So if you're just going to push random workloads through, you can use stuff like TPC benchmarks, but it's totally unrelated to what your applications will face. So unfortunately, it just doesn't make sense to do that. If you want to push synthetic workloads through, you're better off with just like system testing materials that uh, sites like Anand Tech will go and use, any server benchmarking tool that just does purely synthetic workloads. But I wouldn't get SQL Server involved. Uh, Eric for Iceland says, do you present an ROI case for your work to your clients? That is a great question. Let me show you something. I'm going to have to drag this out of, go get this SQL critical care, uh, and then copy this over into here. That's, I didn't want to put it there. Let me put it somewhere else. And where the heck did it go? Here it is. Copy this over here, replace, and go put this up. And then I'll go show this. 
All right, so this is the exact PowerPoint deck that I use when I'm uh, doing a sales call with a brand new client. Somebody can book a sales call right inside my website with like, here's my available calendar and you know, let's go get started. And I start out by talking a little bit about myself and what I do. Then I go through these exact, I just say flat out, now can you talk through these? And what they do is they go through and explain the answers to each of these and this one is the ROI question right here. Why do you want to hire me now? Why do you want to hire me? Why do you want to hire me now? Like, what is it you tell me? And the way that I'll often say it, if they didn't answer this by the time that, and I just let them talk as we go through and I take notes. When, when we get to this point, I'll say, okay, so what's got you to the point where you're ready to spend $7,000 on a consultant? And that, that's flat out the answer right there. And they'll say, well, because we're having this problem and it's stopping us from shipping $200,000 worth of product a day. Well, because we're getting ready to buy a half a million dollar SQL server and we want a sanity check before we do it. Well, because our staff has been struggling with this for six months and we're tired of them beating their heads against the wall. One of the best techniques in sales is listening and letting the customer talk themselves into it often we'll get to this point and I'll be like, so what have you got? What's, where are you at the point where you're ready to spend $7,000 on a sequel or on a consulting? And sometimes they'll go, you know, I don't think we are. And I'll go, okay, no problem. Well, when you're ready to shoot me a call, we'll go, we'll go forward from there. But I, I don't want to talk you into something if you're not ready to pull the trigger on seven grand. And they have to explain the ROI to me rather than me explain it to them. So that's how that works. Next up. <laughs> Let's come back over here for the next one. Luis. Luis says, why don't they add the functionality to add a partition automatically as Oracle does? Remind me, how much does Oracle cost? Oh, it's a lot, isn't it? It's like $47,000 a CPU. For $47,000 a CPU, they should add holes in your belt automatically. They should bring coffee to your desk automatically. They should take you to steakhouses automatically. For that price, they should do that. They should have someone with a white glove that types things in for you as you go to run a query. So that's, that's why they do all kinds of things, because they cost a metric buttload of money that's a measurement to describe how much uh, platinum you can put up your butthole and then use that. Salespeople do that a lot because salespeople make you, you wouldn't want to know what Oracle salespeople make you do. Next up, uh, so next up, Ernesto says, we need to do a conversion from UTC to local time depending on the user's current location. What resolution do you recommend? Uh, I have the app do it. Just have everything in the database should be stored as UTC. If you need to do any kind of time zone changes, that should be done on the application side. SQL Server at $2,000 per CPU core, just a really expensive place to go and do math queries. So that you asked what I would recommend, that's what I would recommend. And then you're like, well, I don't want to do that. I want to go ahead and have SQL Server do all the work. Then you can figure out whatever way you want to roll that. There are all a million different ways that you can roll that. They all suck compared to having the application server do it. Um, so let's uh, block that guy and then off we go to, oh, it's not showing. Oh, let me go uh, put this into the queue because these are kind of cool. Uh, add that, and then add that, and add that, do, 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 uh, add that. All right, so let's see here. Santa says, have you ever seen an odd versus max, uh, even max stop number be an issue? A long, long, long time ago, like SQL Server 2005, there was a bug if you set max stop to three, but it was a really long time ago, like 15 years ago. I haven't seen it be an issue since then. And even SQL Server 2019 setup will actually recommend odd max stop numbers, depending depending on your hardware. For new folks around here, I have asthma, that's why I cough. I could always have the Rona, you never know. We try to be really careful. I wear masks, I wear gloves even when we go outside because my wife knows that I totally put my fingers in my mouth all the time. I just go, oh, this sauce looks excellent. Off we go. 
Uh, next up, Deleep says, how do I randomly show male and female records from 10,000 rows? Or So this is really challenging for SQL Server to return a truly random number of rows. And if you query out there on the web, there are a lot of bad advice, like order by new ID. What that does is it tells SQL Server to scan the whole entire table and generate a new ID on every single row. So what I'd instead say is, let's go step back and see what's the reason why we need to pull these rows and go work deeper from an application perspective. Maybe the application needs to grab uh, ranges of IDs instead, but you don't want to ask SQL Server for random rows. Next up, Scott says, how do we tell what version of the first responder kit is currently installed on SQL Server? Oh, Scott, look away for a second. There's someone's calling you over on the on the other screen. Everybody else, remember how I said nobody ever reads the documentation? Now they won't Google. This is one of those examples. Scott seems like a nice person, so I'm going to go ahead with it. All right, Scott, you're back. Oh, okay, great. Here, I'll show you. So Scott, what we'll do is we'll go over to firstresponderkit.org. So firstresponderkit.org is where the doc, where information is. I, I can't use the documentation word, it's Scott. So we'll scroll down on here. And if I scroll down through here, there's things like how to install the scripts, how to get support. And if I do a control F for version on here, I want to say, that it's listed inside here. It may not be. <laughs> All right, so that's inappropriate. SQL Server First Responder Kit Check Version. So now I got to put this inside there because I've written a post on how to do it and it's a kind of a pain in the rear. Oh man. So of course it's not on there. Oh, All right, let's go do it. So let's go script out. Uh, this is so awesome. Programmability of all the things that need to be clipped. That's probably one of them. Um, so if you go read the code and then modify. Uh, so in here, there is a delete. You've already asked that question. Please don't ask questions repeatedly. I'm going to go ahead and block you, OK? Uh, so in here, there is version check mode on this thing in terms of the parameters. So, <laughs> uh, so declare uh, version vercare 30, uh, version date, date time, exec SP blitz, uh, version equals version. I think how that goes. I can't quite remember how that works. Oops, that should be version equals version. And we'll call it output just to make it more, more clear. Version output and version date output. And then we'll say version equals version output, I think is how that works. Uh, and then version date output, version date, version date equals, uh, and version check mode equals one. Let's see if that works. And then we'll go select version output and select version date output. Let's go try those. Let's see if that works. Oh, no. So now let's go read the documentation. So SQL Server first responder kit, version date. Oh, the G Surgeon says output after parameters. I like that. That's probably it. I think it's that. And then output. Let's try that. Execute. And yay! There we go. That's very cool. So all of the versions use that, or all of the scripts use that exact same syntax. And you can have different versions on each of them. The other thing that you can do is you can run SP Blitz. SP Blitz also checks the versions of all your stuff out there and checks to see how far out of date it is too. But there you go. Um, all right, so next up. I should also apologize to Scott because while that was very funny, it wasn't in the documentation. Oh, I should add it. I should add that in the documentation. Oh, come on, let's do it. 
we can totally do that. So let's go add that into the documentation. So let's go say in GitHub, let's go fire open uh, GitHub and then let's say, uh, let's add a new branch and we're going to say version do uh, date documentation, new branch, create the branch. And then let's go over to the readme in the first responder kit. So first responder kit and then readme. And let's go open that with a notepad. And I'm not going to do that right now. That's going to be boring as hell. So I'm not going to make you watch me do that. But I am going to do that. I'm going to leave it up on my computer so that I uh, go through and hit it. Um, Richard says, what are your thoughts on the longevity of SQL Server? Not because of competition, but because of the general evolution of software. Do you think a proprietary database will be made for the cloud? It already is. Cosmos DB, Amazon Aurora, C uh, Postgres, Amazon Aurora, MySQL. There are tons of them. Tons of those. Uh, next up, Control K, Control C says, is there a good idea to use extended properties for documentation purposes? Well, we've pretty established, pretty well established here on the stream that no one reads documentation. So I don't see people doing that a whole lot. I think it's neat. I think that there are some, I've seen some ERD tools that actually use extended properties for documentation, but given how little people read documentation and keep it up to date, I'm pretty jaded on that kind of thing. Next up, Noemi says, or Norm says, any ways to optimize Azure SQL Server besides building a more expensive plan? Oh, tons. There's query tuning, index tuning, all kinds of settings that you can influence. Absolutely tons of them. Um, and especially it's different between different flavors between Azure SQL DB, Azure SQL DB hyperscale and managed instances. They all have different ways that you go about tuning them by all means. If you want to learn more about that, I'll show you. If you want to learn more about that, search for GitHub SQL Workshops. If you search for GitHub SQL Workshops, Microsoft has a series of training classes that are all self-paced. You have to teach yourself. It's a bunch of training material that you can then go read and uh, walk through on your own time. But it's all totally free. So if you search for GitHub SQL Workshops, uh, Microsoft puts that out there totally for free. Nice of them. <laughs> Next up, uh, Billiard says, what's your second most preferred database engine? Aurora. Amazon Aurora is amazeballs. I love what they do uh, by substituting their own storage engine underneath, how they rely on Amazon S3 to do the storage replication for them. Oh, if you want to learn amazing stuff about databases, search for Amazon Aurora uh, reInvent. At the Amazon reInvent conference, they have all kinds of free videos. You can access them all over YouTube. Um, they go through the mechanics of how Aurora works, and it's just amazing. It's just fantastic. And we use it as a business, too. It's just fantastic. Next up, um, Erica says, on the ROI question, do you state that everything will be everything you say will be billed against you? I actually only do our uh, daily billing and it's only task based. So for example, that SQL critical care is just a flat 7,000 bucks. It's just uh, two days worth of work. Um, and then if they want to hire me for additional work, it's just per day. You know, they can buy as many days as they want. Um, and it, so it's up to them how many of the how many days of my time that they want. So it kind of works out. I'm a really huge fan of minimum daily billing and uh, complete prepayment by clients that you have to pay for my time ahead of time just to make sure that you lock down the spots in my calendar. So I'm in a weird position though. Uh, Ashish says, can we store date time offset in SQL? Yes, 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 you can. I like questions like that. Uh, next up, Sashin says, I wanted to baseline my existing SQL Server in production so that I can say what's normal and what's not. Oh, sure. We teach you how to do that mastering server tuning. Watch the first module in mastering server tuning, and we start right there because having a baseline is uh, really important. So that's the first module in mastering server tuning. Uh, Ruimi says, hey Brent, what's the reason that SQL Server doesn't go parallel even though subtree cost is high? 
So there are a couple of common ones. One is that your query has parallelism inhibitors in the query. It has things like a scalar user defined function, a multi statement table valued function, you're loading data into a table variable or modifying it. There are all kinds of things in SQL Server that just stop parallelism dead. The second reason is parallelism may not help. SQL Server runs calculations across is the work CPU intensive and would it make sense to divide that work across multiple threads? And there are some kinds of work that isn't, doesn't benefit by uh, splitting work across multiple threads. Uh, next up, Billiard says hyper threading to max stop love physical cores. I'm not sure what the question is. Um, so try rephrasing the question. I'm not quite sure. It sounds kind of like you're just stringing a bunch of syllables together, like rutabaga, barbecue, syntax, freshness, joy. I'm like, I'm not quite sure what's going on with that. Control K, Control C says, probably last question, well, if you say so. Uh, Microsoft has an article, Performance Guidelines for Linux. Uh, talk, why, doesn't they why don't they have that for Windows? Do any of y'all Google? Seriously, have you heard of a search engine? Do, do you? You're saying that Microsoft doesn't have documentation on performance on SQL. What the hell is wrong with? Let's go see. So let's say SQL Server Performance Guidelines Windows Site Microsoft.com. And let's see. So, what do we have inside here? Let's go see. There's some down there, there's some there, there's some here, there's some there. All kinds of stuff. Yeah, hmm. Interesting. Billiard says, I'll just go to sleep for that last one. Yes, you are welcome. It's called Google. <laughs> Uh, next up, Benu says, what is the reason we keep an even number of files in TempDB? You know, it's really funny. I just got done rehearsing a demo for that exact thing. If you attend my upcoming Fundamentals of TempDB class, my Fundamentals of TempDB class is happening on, I believe, December 7th. You can go register for it, and it happens to be on sale right now. <laughs> during my Black Friday sale. So you can go over to brentozar.com slash Black Friday and you can buy yourself a seat in that class. And I show you with hands-on demos that you can then go reproduce all kinds of interesting things about TempDB. So that's my Fundamentals of TempDB class over at brentozar.com slash Black Friday. <laughs> Next up, uh, May says, uh, we had a big issue with TempDB. Fundamentals attempt to be course. Plug, plug. Uh, we switched to a user database and wrote the table to a temporary user table. It was way faster. What could be the course? Uh, check out my. Is it too early to plug that? It's too soon. Go to my site. It's fundamentals of attempt to be class. Cover that exact thing. Uh, and then uh, uh, Lewis says, "We will. Will we see a special version of SP Blitz for Azure? You can if you want to write it." So the problem with Azure is that specifically Azure SQL DB, Microsoft has no service level agreement on the DMVs on any of the contents inside Azure. They can and do change the system DMVs that are presented to you. So there was a period in time where we did have compatibility for parts of the first responder kit in Azure and Microsoft kept changing the contents. There's no documentation on what changed in Azure SQL DB when. There's no change log as to what they change. There's no notification as things uh, change. So I'll be damned if I'm going to go volunteer for a multi-billion dollar company building diagnostic info to make their lives easier. They need to go through and fix that, or at least at the very least publish a change log. I mean, that's like just amateur hour, ridiculous for a software vendor. Uh, next up, Ashish or Ankush says, what can be asked in an interview of a tester for Fresher from SQL? It's funny you mention that. I have an interview. Am I plugging too much? But I, I have a class for that. If you go to brentozar.com slash training, there's a DBA interview question uh, class where I give you a bunch of interview questions and answers. So yes, I know my uh, Surly Dev, right? It's a totally wonderful coincidence. 
Um, drop table employees uh, were saying, somebody saying, we're having performance issues and fragmentations at 55%. When I reviewed the doc, you did the what? You were, you were, you read the documentation? Oh man, of all the documentation pages to read, you read the wrong one. Um, so for this, I'll give you a place to go and watch. If you search for uh, Brent Ozar fragmentation, if you search for Brent Ozar fragmentation, and then you go over to search for videos, there's a, there are several free videos that I've got around why fragmentation isn't the problem. So I'm actually glad you caught me before you went and talked to the DBAs. Could 55% fragmentation be a problem? Sure, but it's not going to be the thing that gets you across the finish line with the end users. And I don't want you to go die on that hill with the DBAs to go, the reason why it's slow is because we're 55% fragmented, because that's not the reason why your queries are really slow. And I talk through them in those videos. All right, so this is the end of the question queue. So I want to give a big shout out to Surly Dev, who's our uh, moderator in here, for managing the questions that come over like crazy from YouTube. If it wasn't for Surly Dev, there is no way that this thing would go as smoothly as it possibly could. Um, so enjoy, everybody, enjoy your weekend. I am going to go out, and now it's a beautiful day out here in San Diego. I am going to go get my car washed. I'm going to go get my car washed and uh, uh, then go. I don't think I'm going to go take it for a fast drive or anything, but it's the perfect temperature to go. It's like 48 degrees. It's a perfect temperature to go put the seat heaters on and uh, go uh, put the throttle down and go have some fun. So I will <laughs> certainly do that guy sucks. Over on YouTube, they say. So thanks a lot for hanging out with me today, and I will see you all next time. I will be in here tomorrow morning as well, but tomorrow morning won't. Uh, well, I don't know what tomorrow morning will be. We'll uh, wait and see on that one. It might be questions or it might be uh, demos. So I will see y'all uh, next time. Adios.